today we are here as legal tribune with uh miss matiso madia a well-renowned <laughs> journalist political journalist at that former podcaster and radio broadcaster and the main reason for our meeting or well, the main aim of our meeting is to learn more about the Ace Mahashule and Cyril Ramaphosa um, drama and suspensions and what exactly happened in that. So we welcome you, Ms. Madia, to our legal shabin, and it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much. I don't want to be called a revered anything. Um, I'm really just an observer of history, an observer yeah. of, well, current events which are turning into history, an observer of our upside down political ex existence in the country. Thank you, ladies, for inviting me to the legal shabine. I'm very excited to join you. Okay, so um, we can get right to the questions. Um, first of all, from a knowledgeable point of view. Yes, we read about it in the papers, but there's a lot of things that are left out. Could you just kindly give us a brief summary as to what exactly was happening when suspensions were flying around and things were happening in, in regards to President Ramaphosa and Ace Mahashula and the ANC? Well, you've got to look at those suspensions in context. It's not like those suspensions came out of nowhere. There have been many, many, many fights in the lead up to that particular moment. That particular fight around the suspensions was over whether or not the Secretary General, which is really a powerful position, Ace Makashulu occupied a position often described as the engine of the ANC because he runs operations. So the day-to-day -day runnings of the organization are his responsibility. So there'd been a big fight and it was looming for a really long time. We all knew that at some point there'd be a clash between supporters of Ace Makashuri and supporters of Cyril Ramaphosa because from the very time they were elected actually into power the different sides all said well just five years we won't make it because they were opposing sides these people were at opposing sides of the political spectrum I always say when you're trying to look at the AC battle sometimes look at it as the battle of ideology about the direction the party and ultimately the country needs to go in but then in and of itself is also then riddled with what you call stomach politics patronage politics um, having the right to access network and money and resources and to just spends those through patronage. So it's a very protected battle. And there was a battle around whether or not the Secretary General would remain in his office. He knew it was coming. If you can think back to, I think last year, he kind of fired a salvo saying that he believes a warrant of arrest is coming his way. So he kind of always knew he was a marked man in that particular office. And so then they have the battles that they often have at the National Executive Committee meetings. This is the highest decision-making body in between conferences. Please feel free to cut in, guys, at any point, because it's very convoluted. The happenings of the ANC are quite convoluted, but they, they ultimately are groupings that fight to be the dominant voice within the organization. And the dominant voice in this particular regard said that those who are facing criminal charges must step aside and that's how ace was tainted ace Mahashule has been arguing that no the 2017 resolution that the party decided on says that everybody who's implicated in corruption should step aside according to ace this includes Cyril Ramaphosa hence he um unilaterally issued a suspension letter against Cyril Ramaphosa saying but this is according to the 2017 resolution but as far as ace is concerned the dominant voice the dominant view in that NEC made a decision that those who are facing corruption charges and the user rule, I think it's 25.70 in the ANC's constitution to say in order to protect the organization, these people, no hearing, no appeal, must step aside or be reviewed every six months. And that's kind of what happened to Ace, but he's fighting back, hence the other suspension letter. Okay, so when you say he's fighting back, is his refusal to apologize a manner in which he's using to fight back? Is he trying to say that I'm not guilty? Is he trying to say, if I have to apologize, then this, and then President Ramaphosa has to do this? Um, what are the terms and conditions around his not wanting to apologize? 
if you speak to Ace Mahashir, he tells it's about principle. Um, he calls me from time to time and we speak about his troubles and I report on them. And he argues to it's not about being um, stubborn and, and, and being angry with the ANC. It's about principle. That's the argument he makes. But in the greater scheme of things, to be honest with you, Fineka, it's also political. Polit in politics, perceptions matter. The person who caves in between these two leaders is seen to be weaker. Cyril Ramaphosa has a very long okay. period of being seen as the weaker leader the ANC for a very long time and I think his faction muscled its way and it is the dominant faction at the moment and they're exercising the dominance in a way that's left others upset but I must tell you before him the dominance was had by a faction that supported former President Jacob Zuma and they also pretty much used their minds in a similar manner um, and Ace Makasulu who was called a lifetime chair, he was in charge of the ANC in the Free State since 1992 until 2017, he is often accused of dealing with people in such a ruthless manner. Um, with regards to the apology, it's he who caves is weaker. And Ace Makashiri knows that. He can't afford to cave. I often say to them, so there is no turning back. You guys have positioned yourselves in a way that you can't retract. None of you can afford to retract because politically you look weaker for it. So there is that also that argument as well. And Ace Makashiri will not want to look weaker. He does not want to be seen to cower to a Cyril Ramaphosa. And Cyril Ramaphosa's presidency cannot afford to have a leader seem to be weakened merely by threats and refusals to say, you know, Ace Makashile won't step down. When we started the meeting, I said to you, oh, I've got deadlines. It's because they had a closed meeting, a National Working Committee meeting yesterday, and a lot of the talk was the ANC must move towards explaining Ace Makashule. And I had insiders calling me saying, no, that's not what we're going to do yet. We want to investigate him for misconduct. We want to engage him about failing to apologize to the ANC for what he did with regards to the suspension letter. So there'll be constant back and forth um, between the different factions. So on what grounds can a person who is currently facing corruption charges be successful in, in terms of like asking for a reversal with regards to the suspension? Within the ANC, of course. Everything else outside yes. of the ANC is by the law and should be independent bodies and the party should not have a say. Within the ANC, it's such a hard one. The suspension that's been issued out is under that rule I was talking about, 25.70. When you read the rule, it doesn't have room for appeals. It doesn't have room for um, trying to make an argument. I mean, it's an appeal, an argument against the suspension. It places the organization above the person. However, the NEC and Jesse Duarte, the um, Deputy Secretary General, said to me that they're trying to put in processes because one of the excuse me, one of the processes in the lead up to this particular moment was setting up guidelines that and principles that would guide the process of stepping aside for the ANC. And those allow for an independent body to work as an appeals body. But again, the rule in black and white that trumps the, the guidelines is this one that says that there is no appeal, that the only mechanism of review is one that asks for the party to look at your case in six months' time, hoping that maybe your matter has been dealt with and is no longer in the courts uh, sorry about my internet, but that your matter is no longer in the courts or that it's moved on and you can, and you can come back. But for someone like Ace, the, the, the fear is at his age, um, a comeback gets ruled out. And the way our court systems operate, justice turns very slowly in our country. There's no guarantee that the matter will be off the table, off the roll. Um, dismissed in any way by the time six months roll mm -hmm. in and that's part of the fight is that this closes the window to his political career really okay so um ooh, this is it's, it's deeper than what i actually thought it's like so i was saying it's so convoluted you gotta do i always argue that people have to do a little bit of reading on the ANC when they want to understand the ANC, because nothing is fresh. You need institutional yeah. memory to understand mm -hmm. what you're dealing with. I often rely on much older journalists like Musofi Mokwe and Abu Mashati to ask them, so you were there in 2007, what do you remember? What do you remember from 19 what what? In politics, institutional memory is everything. Wow. I'm, I'm just shocked by the information I'm getting right now. Because, like I'm saying, all no, 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 <laughs> not at all. It's good because a lot of people are, hmm, what's happening? We see the suspensions here, letters of suspensions there, there's this, there's... So, but then, now, considering that ACE has been suspended, the people who are in support of his 
of him and him not getting suspended would he would they be deemed to be in the same basket as him or in the same group and okay. would they be deemed to be as corrupt as he is portrayed to be I'm going to very, this is the only warning I'm going to give you guys as people in the law fraternity. And you learn it when you, I suppose you you should know this. There is no such thing as a clean politician. I don't believe in one. I think that to paint one set of politicians as corrupt and be the other as saints is dangerous. That's how South Africa got to where it is. Um, when people argue, oh, Praveen is clean, I go away. He's a politician, guys. Um, they have maneuvered the system exactly the same way that they operate in similar ways. Some color in the lines, some color outside the lines. It really, for me, on a, on a, on a greater scheme of things, the way I deal with politicians is same, same. And I think if you adopt that attitude, you help yourself, you know. People were applauding Zoe, Dr. Zoelim Kize. Have you seen the allegations of corruption coming out of the Department of Health during COVID? It's scary because politicians are the same. But anyway, um, I don't think the people who are in ACES camp are necessarily in the same light. You've got somebody like Bongani Bongo, who is also facing corruption charges, who's also been suspended. But in the greater scheme of things, the thing about politics is it's fluid, right? So today you are in a grouping that's deemed to be horrible and should be outcast. Tomorrow you can easily work your way back into the group that's dominant and be a hero. So it really, the situation switches from president to president to the politics of the day and the issues of the day um they, they talk about people like turncoats figil and balula is somebody that people attack a lot because figil and balula for instance wasn't pro Cyril ramaphosa figil and balula in 2012 wasn't pro jacob zuma and then he switched sides and pledged allegiance to whoever's in charge at the moment and people say yeah but you do that to look after your stomach you know you do that because you want to remain a minister you're a turncoat you're not loyal so you find that in politics, nobody's loyal to anything but themselves. Um, so you you can't necessarily put, I, I can't never, I can never put people in one basket because they move, it's so fluid. It's so scary how loyalty switch. I don't know if you'll believe me if I said to you, once upon a time, Praveen Godan was loyal to Jacob Zuma, from a praise of Jacob Zuma, he was, he was, absolutely. I mean, Julius Malema was once loyal to Jacob Zuma as well, said that, you know, that kill for Zuma. Huh? Today, where are they? So you need to understand how politics is loyal to nobody but self. Um, so nobody can really be in, a, in, a, in one single bread basket because they'll negotiate a way out and that way out might be to throw somebody else under a bus. Um, it's a silly system, but it is what it is. So with the ANC being the ruling party in South Africa right now, would the internal conflicts then affect the fight against the coronavirus pandemic, the fight of stopping the third wave? Does their fight impact society when facing or dealing with the pandemic? I think their fights have impacted society through and through. ANC's battles reverberate right throughout the country. Um, of course, it'll affect COVID because they were stealing COVID-19 PPEs. People linked to the ANC. I mean, people linked to the ruling governing party. I don't like to call it a ruling party because we're not a dictatorship. We're, we're a democracy and they've been mandated to govern. I strongly feel people linked to the governing party have been found wanting and their battles often take away the focus from very necessary things in the country. You don't even have to look at just COVID and, and COVID resources and the third wave, which we are currently in. It's not about that. It's about basic things, basic service delivery, where money is looted when it's meant to build roads to provide water and electricity. And then they fight over that money amongst themselves then you have a big issue. Um, I definitely think that the ANC has gotten in the way. In fact, I've often moved to saying South Africans, when you go to elections, you need to think really hard about whether or not the current state of the country, the status quo works for you. If it does, fantastic, continue recognizing that the issues that we have are because our governance can't focus on anything but internal issues. They themselves often say they're too focused on 
narrow factional battles within the party or if there's something else that we should be looking for as a country and i think maybe that's what we need to drive ourselves towards as citizens is what can we do differently to better our country that i think is is a, is a big message for me as a citizen more than anything else so just looking at what you said and also the current situation how's that going to affect the upcoming by-elections so the by-elections have happened. I think the last role of by-elections has taken place. Where we are headed to now are the municipal elections. And the sad thing about the, 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 the local government polls is that they get overshadowed by national politics. So the politics of personalities, mm -hmm. because we have big leaders, big personalities, and people are driven towards the politics of those leaders. In fact, I think a great example to show what happens to localized issues with national politics is looking at the fees must fall uh, movement, at least the, 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 the recent ones, the, the, the recent protests. I was watching young, young people demonstrating and taking an issue with ENCA. Now, an issue with ENCA is an EFF at national level issue. However, the students were also taking issue. And I said to, I said to somebody, it's like, but I they have no focus on what their actual issue is as students, because that's where the different political parties have once come together to fight for a greater cause. Now you're fighting your national bodies, your national, your mother body's issues. You're talking about ENCA, that's a Julius Malema battle. It's not for the EFFSC, I think. Um, it's in a similar light, one would make an argument that you saw ANC people making arguments about step aside and this, and then you're like, but your battle is fees focus guys mm -hmm. so you you often feel that um the larger political happenings tend to overshadow the micro politics and that will exactly be the case as far as um local governments concerned in fact with the recent by-elections i was speaking to a lot of people where you look at the da shedding voters da showed voters to the pa and national leaders of called saying td what we are watching is the rise of identity politics in the country and it's a dangerous space you're watching colored nationalism where the people who are leading the pa might have been convicted criminals but it's not as important for the colored community as it is having colors represent their needs why because the majority government the the, the governing party has ignored a lot of their cries over the years so you are finding that a lot of gaps um, and people withdrawing seeking to be served but that is also aligned to the bigger national politics um i think that's where the issue is is that first of all the local government polls are overshadowed by the big personalities at the top they're overshadowed by the needs of national politics and over and above that i think that we are still in the pandemic we are in the third wave i think all signs of that by october may be things might be slightly better but you have a problem with a sluggish government where the vaccine program has been i think calling it unsatisfactory is an understatement um it's scary it's so scary i'm still working from home <laughs> so it's all of those things that um that are, that are worrying but the fact that violations have been able to happen might be a sign in the a, 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 you know a move in the right direction the fact that the iec has brought on a body led by former deputy chief justice to look at what's possible versus what's not possible with regards to getting people out to vote i think those things matter um the unfortunate thing is in a pandemic not the right kind of campaigning is being able to be done and not the right kind of issues are being lifted and being dealt with yeah okay so <laughs> I'm just gonna go no, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so overwhelmed. But it's, it's a very good interesting. Approach. It's very yeah. interesting. It's broader than what I could have ever imagined. And this is why I said in the beginning that we are asking questions that we don't have answers to. Because yeah. what you read sometimes is filtered so that there is no favoritism and you remain objective whenever you speak. Please but, that I'm objective even here. It might sound hard to believe. But no, I'm, you sound quite objective. I think I am. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> you definitely are. You definitely are. And this is why we get, we say you are world re world renowned. Well, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, um, I just have a question. Said it, I'll continue laughing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just have a question. So I'm quite curious myself with regards to um Sarah Ramaphosa as well as Ismail Khashoggi. But most importantly, how can Sarah Ramaphosa 
bring back his leadership? How can he cement himself at this point in time? I think he's currently doing that. Um, uh, they call it slow poison. You know, a lot of people, we always laugh at how for the longest time, everybody's been so frustrated with Cyril's leadership. Cyril's a person of processes. Cyril's a person mm. of consultation. It is really exhausting. Uh, I think for NC members, but mostly for us as a country, you want a leader who just takes a damn decision, do the thing, you know? And that's not Cyril's mm. style of leadership. But I think that um, what we are seeing in the ANC, if it's anything, the, the slow poison supposedly seeping in. Some people have praised it. I think that it is dangerous to think that because his faction is in charge and now they're discharging and cementing their power in the party that you think that that means the ANC's come right. Please always go back to what I said about how all politicians are the same. Um, where I think we must be worried about Cyril Ramaphosa is in his role in governance. I think that's what must preoccupy South Africans, not so much the ANC. The idea that when the ANC coughs, the country, well, when the ANC sneezes, the country catches the flu. We've got to be able to divorce ourselves from that as a country. Hence, earlier I said, we've got to start looking at other ways to serve our democracy because it's our country. It's not the ANC's country. It's not Cyril Ramaphosa's country. I think that... Um, He's consultative in his ways, he's cautious in his ways, and by and large, we've seen how that's dragged on. But if what he's doing in the ANC is anything to go by, maybe we'll start seeing a bit more decisive action after taking his time for so long. I mean, his term is almost up. His term is almost up. Mm. Next year, the ANC elects a new president, and if it's not Cyril Ramaphosa, that might mean the beginning of the following year, Cyril Ramaphosa's era is done. You know, they might mm. move them, push them out, as we've seen them do with two other former presidents. Um, yeah, it's a very hard one. For me, my struggle with our president is dishonesty. I've struggled to feel like he's an honest character. And I have sat down for interviews with him, and I've walked out saying, I don't know if I'm convinced by the things that he's saying. When you ask him about corruption and you ask him about the state of our coffers and the role of the ANC, in the, the dire state of those things. And he can't come out and give a forthright answer. That for me is a struggle, especially because as a journalist, you're able to make very real examples of Mr. President, so at such and such a period, this is what you said. And today I'm asking you again and you can't give me guarantees. So you left feeling really frustrated. Um, it's a frustrating presidency. Even the lack of engagement with media is often cause for our rant and raving on social media because it's, it's just simply not enough. He said he'd be different and in more ways than one, he's actually the same. And that speaks to the party and not just individuals mm -hmm. who are occupying the seat of power within the governing party. Yeah, well, so there's a statement that caught me right there. Sure. Mm. You said the manner in which he acts is a reflection of the party itself and not just the, uh, the just president. The I think you can't divorce. Yeah, sorry, let me let you finish. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I just, I want us to dwell on this just a little bit because if the manner in which the president right now is operating is the manner in which the ANC is operating at large. What does that say for our future, one, as a country? Two, what does it say for the ANC's future in politics, whether or not they will still be in existence after 10 five, 10, 15 years, considering that we still have our parents who are like ANC, no matter mm. what happens, but ANC. You don't, owe ANC that. you don't owe any party that kind of loyalty. Not to your parents, mm. but you know it for a fact. Um, I think that it's disjointed. I think that anybody, and, and there was that, by the way, there were people in the country who would love to divorce Sarah Ramaphosa from the ANC. You can't. You simply can't. He served in the ANC. He was part of the wasted nine years that he speaks of. He was a deputy, he was a second in command. So you can't remove him from the decisions and the actions of the ANC. Never ever make that mistake. People often want to divorce him from it because they like him so much, because funders like him so much. Hey, what? You can't do that. That's giving him a cop out and you should never ever give that to any leader. So that's a big thing for me. And I think it's a disjointed leadership that we see. Um, in the ANC and it articulates itself often 
in everything else in our country. Hence, if you look back again, if you reflect on the conversation we've had, I speak, you asked about the impact on society and I said, they're failing society because they're not focused on service delivery, they're focusing on themselves. Um, what that says about the future of the country, it says to me, to tell you guys to think hard about where you want the country to go. The future's yours, it's not your parents. It's not your parents, the future's yours. You must make a determination about what the future must be. And the ANC's future will be guided by that too. But the ANC's future does not need to be more important than your future, your kids' future, your friends' future, your mm. siblings' future. South Africans have to understand that the country is theirs. It's not the ANC's. It doesn't matter how many ANC leaders tell you about the fight um, against corruption. It's, it's neither here nor there. Honestly, neither here nor there. We are here now. We are here now, and are they squandering the gains that they claim to have given to the country? What are they doing with it? Are they creating a country that you want your kids to grow up in, or are they creating a country that you're going to have to flee from? Those are the considerations we need to make. When we look around our communities, what do you feel? What comes to mind? That's what I think South Africans must think. If this works, fantastic, continue, South Africans, continue. If it doesn't, think hard. Act fast, change it. That's my parting shot. We don't have to be bothered by Thank the ANC. I mean, sorry, we don't have to be bothered by factional battles in the ANC. Those are not our problems as a country. That's the ANC's problem. Wow. Um, thank you so, so much for taking your time and for such an insightful conversation we had with you. I learned a lot. And really, I think I would like to engage with you quite a lot more about different things. Yes. So I'm definitely certain we might, as the legal should be, just ask for one or two more meetings, conversations. As long as they're not in the way, for today, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Okay. But for today, thank you so, so much. It's Thank a pleasure. You. Thank you guys so much. I think it's <laughs> Thank fantastic. You so much for your time. I think it's incredible that you are young <laughs> and seeking answers and seeking to engage. I think that's the right path. That's the path that I'm talking about. Like trying to figure out what's happening in your world and how you play a role in your world or how it relates to you. So you can chart your way around that um that existence. I think that's the future. That's it, guys. Well done. Okay. Thank you so I'll much for that.